Is it running? Okay. Yeah, okay. Welcome everyone. <laughs> I think I don't need to introduce myself, but I will do it anyways for the, for the recording. So my name is Martin. I'm running a web design agency here in Singapore called Bitmask. And we build uh, websites with Django and Python. We have been doing this for the last four or five years. And um, yeah, so the last six months or so, I was building a mobile app for one of our biggest clients. And uh, we were using React.js for this app. And that means I had to use a lot of JavaScript. And I had to expose myself to this new technology called React. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out it's actually pretty great technology. And I really enjoy doing front-end development with that. But I never really understood how, I, how can I use React with Django. And um, two weeks ago, I found a blog post which described how you can do this. And I read this blog post, and I tried it out myself. And after like a f maybe half an hour or so, I got it up and running. And I was pretty excited about it um, that I finally have a solution how I can easily start using uh, React.js for small parts of my existing websites and migrate everything over to React slowly. So, <clears throat> and because I wanted to share this with everyone, I created a little repository on GitHub that shows, it's basically supposed to be a step-by-step -step guide that teaches you how you can set up Django and then how you can create your first few React components and use them in your Django application. So maybe just a quick show of hands, who has used Django before? Yeah, okay, <laughs> only, <laughs> only Vina. <laughs> Who has used and like and who has used well, React heard before? About, usually use the word heard about. <laughs> heard about. Okay. Who has heard about Django? Oh, the movie. Oh. <laughs> 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 the movie. <laughs> it's not going to be as bloody today. Um, yeah. Okay. The so. Is a little bit more famous. Yeah, I heard a little bit. Yeah. From the guys that they are the product. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that means you are like the toughest audience I could possibly have. <laughs> So what we will do is we will, I will show this repository, and we will go, I will go step by step through this and try to make it pretty fast so that we can wrap up the recording. And then afterwards, when you've seen everything, so, so you don't have to follow now because it will be too quick, afterwards uh, we will go back to step one and we will try to reproduce it on your computers. Okay? So basically, um, Django is a so-called web framework, so that means it handles uh, a lot of things for you. It can render templates, so you will write HTML and CSS. Who has written HTML and CSS? OK, maybe half. Yeah, that's great. So you, you know how to, how to build websites. So Django basically is a framework that helps you to build websites. It, it has like batteries included, so it deals with a lot of things like dealing with cookies and authentication. Uh, it can talk to your database and do many, many things. And so that's, that's why a lot of people use it for building web applications. Um, React.js, people say like, you might have heard about the term MVC here. Model view controller, right? Um, who has heard about the term? Who knows what MVC means? Okay, so basically, um, when you write a complex application that um, should render stuff to the user, for example, if, if you go to a website, you see something in the browser, right? So that is basically the view. That is uh, what is being displayed to the user, okay? That's the V. Um, in the back end, in order to see this website here, for example, there's a database somewhere on, on Earth which has all these, this, this content here. Um, <clears throat> and um, there is going to be a controller that takes out this data from the database. And usually there's a model that is able to, to hold this data for you. And the model is going to be passed to the view, and the view will render the data. OK, it's probably still <laughs> very difficult to, uh, to, to imagine, but uh, it's, it's a very famous pattern when building web applications or any, any kind of uh, GUI applications. So um, Facebook invented this software called React.js, which makes uh, the V in MVC very easy, supposedly. Unfortunately, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult to understand uh, when, when, I mean, I was using Python for maybe five years. I was using JavaScript even longer. I don't know, maybe eight or nine years. <laughs> uh, 
uh, mostly jQuery only, like most web developers. So I'm, I didn't really write pure JavaScript. And that was my first problem. Uh, because jQuery spoiled me so much, I wasn't really able to read pure JavaScript. And that was the first hurdle I had to take in order to get into the React e ecosystem. Because when you read React code, it's basically pure JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so the, the task today is to see how we can marry these two technologies, how we can build a little Django website that uses React.js components for the front end. Okay? That's, that's the big picture. Um, and we will do this by simply going through the step-by-step -step guide here on GitHub. I, don't, I didn't prepare any slides or anything. So basically, when you go to this repository here on GitHub, so it's my username, Ambroch, and then uh, Django React.js boilerplate, you will see a readme file that tells you how you can quickly install the master branch on your computer. And then you could do uh, this command, this is from Django, manage py run server and go to, in your browser, go to localhost, and then you should see something. But this is basically the end result, okay? The, uh, usually, if you want to follow the step-by-step -step guide, you would scroll down here in the readme file and click at step one. And then, um, so for those who are familiar with Git, who, know, who knows how to use Git? Okay, almost everyone. So you know that there are branches, right? Usually, uh, in a normal project, everybody works on the master branch, and maybe you have a development branch. But for this, I had this crazy idea that I will create one branch for each step, and then make sure that people can you know, switch through the branches, which is pretty easy on GitHub, and follow the steps, and compare. You will build files on your disk, right? And you want to compare if your files look similar to the ones in my GitHub repository. So that's why I made it this way. So the first step is uh, simply creating a Django project. And all you need to do for that is actually one, two, these four commands. You could probably even skip the first one if you don't care about virtual environments. So pip is a software that comes with Python to install Python packages. So in the, in the Python package that we need to install is called Django. Once we have that installed, we have another command available on the terminal, which is called Django admin. And this command has a subcommand called start project, and then we give our project a name. So I just call this like Django React, DJ React. This is the name of our Django project, okay? And what this command here does is it creates a DJ React folder on your hard drive, which already has a few files inside that come that Django automatically generates for you is like the minimum amount of files that you need in order to run a Django project. And the last command here is not necessary really, but I like to rename the DJ React folder into Django because it's a Django project. So what you will end up with is something like this. The Django folder, which has a manage.py file and the DJ React folder, and inside of that folder, you will have the very important file settings.py. I will, I will talk about this file a lot today, so try to remember this. A URLs.py, and this file we can ignore. Um, so I explained a few other things, like if you install something with pip, you should also create a requirements.txt file and put this same requirement into that file. So when you look into this file, it looks like this. There's just Django inside, the latest version. Um, that's just best practice. It's not really relevant to when this you do project. Hmm? So when you do do no, I will, when you need to do something, I will tell you. <laughs> it's after after we stop the recording, basically. So after you ran basically these two commands here, you should be able in your terminal to do manage py run server. Oh, I already have it running actually. Yeah, you should be able to do manage py run server. And then in your browser, you can go to localhost, and you will see the Django welcome website. That's basically the, if you didn't do anything, this is what Django will look like. It will show your welcome screen, just to tell you that uh, your, your settings, settings file is correct and that everything worked, okay? So that's the first step, just installing Django and creating a project, super easy. And as a second step, I basically want to create a view so that we can see like a hello world text in our browser. So this is supposed to be our old Django app, right? We, we, I built this because I want to enhance my old Django apps and use React.js component instead of normal Django HTML code, okay? So 
in order to uh, hook up a view in Django, you need to go into the URLs py file, and you need to add this line here. And I actually added two views for demonstration purposes. So this basically says that at the URL view to slash, we should show this template, and at no URL at all, so basically the home page, we should show this template. Okay. Uh, then you need to add a setting that tells Django where it can find the templates. And then you need to create the actual templates. So those of you who have already written HTML should be familiar with this. Basically, we will have a, a base HTML file um, and then the two template files for the two different views. So Django has this cool thing that is called template inheritance. That means, I mean, usually uh, when you build an HTML site, they always need all this boilerplate code here. Right? Every HTML website needs to have an HTML tag, a head tag, a body tag, and so on. And, but for our views, we don't really want to repeat all this every single time. So that's why we can put this into one central file. And then the subfiles for, the, for each view, they will extend the central file. Okay? So that basically means uh, everything that's in between the block main here, which is just uh, a tag that says view1, should be rendered in the base HTML file in here. So this part will be replaced with this part. OK? Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the code again, so that you can visualize how it looks on the file system, basically what we did in this step is we created the templates folder and the three files that I just showed. Right. So when you, when you go into the file, you can see it's just this template file with the block. And the other two files, they extend the base file and they fill in some content into the block. OK? Um, and that's the step. Uh, when you did this and you run in your terminal, you run manage py run server, you will see view one, which is the thing that we put in view1.html in the file, right? Or if we go to the other URL, view2, we will see view2. OK, so this should already, if you have never done uh, web development and you want to get into it and you thought that Django might be a good technology, this should get you excited. It's like, wow, I just have to create a few templates. I put something into the URLs.py file, and I can see something in the browser. right? And from here, you could start actually writing your, making your website beautiful, add more content. And then afterwards, you will get like you will ask yourself, hmm, how can I have some more dynamic stuff? How can I save something into the database and get it out of the database? So from here onwards, you will dig deeper into the Django documentation and, and learn more about Django, but which we won't do today. Um, so the next step is the one where people who want to use uh, React.js often struggle or give up. So this took me, I don't know, maybe a few weeks to get my Webpack config nice and correct and understand what's going on. Uh, like six months ago when I started using React.js for, for my project. Um, so <clears throat> Why do you need to use React.js for your project? Um, we wanted to build a mobile app, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to use AngularJS. So there's a software called Cordova that allows you to write a mobile app but use web technology. And um, yeah, I heard. Of, I just heard about React.js, and uh, people were pretty excited about it, and said it's very, very fast, and it gives you a mobile, it gives you a chance to build a mobile app that almost feels native. So that's why I thought I'll just give it a try, and it turned out to actually work and look really good. That's why I decided to use React.js in the first place. Yeah, and a few months later, Facebook released React Native. And then we threw away my React.js mobile app, and we migrated everything to React Native, which is a very similar technology, but uh, it uses the actual iOS and Android native views, so it feels even more native. It's, it's really cool technology. But it uses almost the same code as the app that we had already built. So the migration was actually very painless. Um, <clears throat> so this is the most difficult step here. Um, the problem is uh, with React, you, you write your front end using JavaScript. Okay? And usually, you will have one JavaScript file, which is the so-called entry point into your app. And from there, you import a lot of other smaller files, and you use them. 
And inside of those smaller files, you might import even more small, smaller components. And it's all JavaScript code, OK? And, but the problem is the browser doesn't really know about how to do imports and all these kind of things. The browser really just wants to have, the browser says, give me one uh, component.js file that I can load, and then I, I try to execute that file. Right? We cannot give a lot of files to the browser and expect the browser to execute those files correctly. So what we need to do is we need to bundle our whole app into one big JavaScript file that includes everything. And then we can put this file on a content delivery network or wherever we host our static files for our website and make sure that the browser can download this file and execute it. So this is what this software called Webpack is all about. It asks you, where is your entry point into your application? And where should I save the bundle? And then it goes into your uh, files and, and gobbles them all up and tries to put them into one big file. Okay. Um, the problem is, <coughs> um, yeah. So usually, when you develop like this with React.js, you want to do something that is called hot reloading. <coughs> so that means you see your work in your browser and you are working in your editor, and every time you save, your browser gets updated. Okay, so that means that kind of uh, um, Webpack generates a new bundle on the fly, but it doesn't really save it to the database, but it keeps it in memory. And there is a tricky, magical way how Webpack can communicate with your browser and, t and tell the browser that the bundle has just been updated, and then the browser will refresh itself. And there's a Django application called Django Web Webpack Loader, which has only one purpose. It, um, it tries to teach Django what is the current file name of your latest bundle. Okay? Uh, we will see that later when we actually generate a bundle. You will see that the file names, they always have a random string at the end. So every time we save and we, we change our code, the file name of the final bundle changes as well. And um, that's a problem with Django because um, usually when you just hook up, let's say, jQuery.min.js, it's always this file name. Django always knows that this is the file I have to download and, and execute. But with our own bundles, we will always have these random strings at the end. So the, uh, Django needs to be up to date and know what is our latest file that we have saved. Is this uniquely to your project? Mm. Is this the way that we have saved files or like? I could configure Webpack in a way that it always saves the files with exactly the same name. But it's usually not, not a good idea because then when your user refreshes the browser, like, like the user comes back to your website the next day, then the old file has been cached by the, brow by the browser. So the browser sees like app.js, all right, I downloaded this last uh, week already, so I will use it again. So then the user will be using an outdated version of your app, right? But by just changing the file name every time, the browser will think that this is a new, uh, a new static asset that it needs to download again, and then you never have these problems that users have outdated, uh, are running outdated code. Cool yeah. So, <clears throat> anyways, in order to use a third-party Django application, we need to install it, same way like we install Django. So we run pip install Django Webpack Loader, and then most third-party Django apps are used in the same way. You add them to your settings.py file. Remember, I said this is the super important Django settings file. So we add one line to that file here. And then we add a few more lines further down the file, telling uh, Django where we are saving our static assets. So static assets is like JavaScript files, CSS files, images that should be displayed on the website. These are considered static assets. OK? The, mm, OK, and then we need this crazy, scary looking package.json file. This basically is the same like the requirements.txt file that we use in Python. So it's also just a file that tells your project what kind of software needs to be installed so that this project works. And we basically just put in package names here and the version numbers that we want to have. All right? You remember when I showed you the requirements text file, it only had one line, Django equals equals 1.9.3. So that's the Django package for Python that we want to install. And here's the same. We want to install a JavaScript package called Babel, and it's this version, and a lot more JavaScript packages. So, But let's just ignore them for now. Um, so the config that we need to generate for, the, for Webpack is, looks kind of scary at first, uh, because <clears throat> I split it up into two files. 
it's going to be a base config. And then further down, we have a second file, which, is, which has almost the same name, but there's local in here. Okay? Uh, this will make more sense later when I talk about deployment, because um, usually in the real world, you have your own computer, you have a staging server, and you have a production server. Okay? And you need to generate three different versions of your app for the three different environments. Because, for example, when you develop locally, your API might have this address. Localhost 8000 API version 1, right? But on your staging server, it might be this address, sandbox.myapp.com API version 1. And on the production server, it's just myapp.com. So you have diff the website is basically running on three different machines, your own machine, the staging machine, the production machine. And that means that your app, the, the, which is in the JavaScript bundle, right, needs to know uh, to which API am I talking to right now? So these kind of things have to be hard coded into the app, and so that that is the reason why we need three different config files. Okay, but most of the config files is exactly the same for all three environments. So that's why we have a base config file, which has most of the stuff, and then we have uh, specific config files for the other environments, which override a few things that need to change for that environment. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at the base config file. Um, this um, module exports thing here is a JavaScript thing. That means that down here we can import that config file. So if, if you have done a little bit of Python already, you know that you can do this from uh, Django import models, right? You can, in your Python files, you can import other Python modules. And this is the same in JavaScript here, uh, but it looks, I mean, the syntax is a little bit different. It basically says that we want to import this JavaScript file, and we want to put it into this variable name, okay? And then the question is, what will actually end up in this variable name? And it will be the thing that this file here exports, okay? And what does it export? It exports something that looks very much like a Python dictionary. You know the Python has dictionaries with uh, curly brackets and it has lists with square brackets, right? So JavaScript basically has the same thing. I think in JavaScript this is not called dic dictionary, it's probably, I don't know, it's called object, I guess, right, Mike? Yeah. So we are basically uh, creating an object that has several attributes. So context is one attribute, entry is one attribute, output is one attribute, and each attribute has certain values. And the important one here is the entry point, right? We are telling Webpack where is the JavaScript file where my uh, React.js application <laughs> begins. You will notice that there is no .js ending here. You can leave out the ending. Be because you are free to put to name it .js or .jsx or in any way, actually. So by leaving out the ending, Webpack will be able to just find the file that's called app1.anything and assume that this is your entry file, OK? Um, we will ignore this for now. Um, and then this output pass is important. So this tells Webpack where the final bundle file should be saved on your hard drive. Okay? So, um, okay, maybe I should talk about this vendors thing here. The problem is React Native is like jQuery. It's a pretty big library. It's, I don't know, maybe 180 kilobytes or even, even more. So, <clears throat> and, um, it will never really change. As long as Facebook doesn't release a new version of React.js, this library will not change. So it would be cool if your browser can download this big library and cache it. So the next time when the user comes back, this is already in cache and doesn't need to be re-downloaded again. But the stuff that changes all the time, which is our own app, right? this should be in a different file. So by using this um, Commons Chunks plugin here, and by saying that, um, React should be a different entry point. Uh, Webpack will generate two bundle files. It will generate one super big bundle file that, cr that uh, contains React.js and everything that's related to React.js. And it will, con it will create one small bundle file which only contains our own code that we have actually written, which in comparison to React.js is tiny, right? And yeah, so that's, that's the purpose of the Commons Chunk plugin. And the rest we can ignore for now. Um, so that's the base config, okay? The local config, um, 
Ah, yeah, okay. So the local config, first of all, it imports the base config into the variable name config, and then it overrides a few of the attributes. So you, up here you can see that we defined the pl plugins attribute, and it's a list of plugins, okay? So down here, we are overriding the plugins attribute, and we are adding, we are concatenating some elements to that list. So basically we are saying, in general, we want to use the, the commons chunk plugin, but if we are developing on our local machines, we want to add the bundle tracker plugin. All right? I will explain what the bundle tracker plugin does later. Um, <clears throat> so if you would run uh, Webpack now, it would probably crash and give you some syntax errors. That's because uh, there is um, a new version of JavaScript emerging called uh, ES2015. And this has a lot of things that, um, for example, it has classes. Um, it has this kind of way of importing things. So this looks, you know, this is still JavaScript down here. Here it looks much more like Python already, right? Import something from something. When you compare it to this, this is also just an import, but it looks completely different. Because this is written in the old way, and this is written in the new way. And in order to, be, uh, to teach Webpack that it it's, should be able to deal with the new way, you need to create this uh, bubble RC file and put these settings inside. This is also a pitfall. Like when you want to get into React.js development, you do everything like they describe it in a tutorial. But most tutorials don't tell you about this because most people have this file in their home folder and they forgot about it, that they had to set this up, this file, a few months ago. And for them, everything just works. But when you try to reproduce it, nothing works at all because you don't have this file yet. So yeah, you need to copy and paste this into this file. Um, so now we would basically have um, configured Webpack correctly, <coughs> but we don't have any JavaScript code yet that Webpack can run. So that means we need to create an app1.jsx file, which is supposed to be our entry point, right? And in this file, this is actually how React.js looks like. And we will talk about this later. So for, for, for the purpose of this step here, we just want to be able that we can compile something and see something in the browser. So we create one component here. And this component uses another component that I'm also importing here. So that means we have to create a file for that other component as well and implement that component as well, right? And for like um, demonstration purposes, I went even further. So this file is using another component called headline, which I'm importing here, right? So we need a third file, um, which is another React component. So you will already see a pattern. When you look at these components, you always see that there's a class. It has the same name as the file name. That's a good convention. And it extends react.component. And you have to import React here. So that's why React is available here. Okay? And inside of that class, we are defining functions, very similar to Python classes. And the, the most important function is called render. And it's supposed to return something. And what it should return is basically something that looks like HTML code. Right? You, you, are, you have seen this h1 tag here. Um, and here, we, we, there is some magic happening. There's some variable stuff inside the HTML. And the interesting thing is, when, and here's the same, right? For the headline, for the headline component, we have uh, a class called headline, which is the same as the file name. The class has a render function, and the render function returns some HTML. And the interesting thing is, when you go one step uh, one step up, the headline component can now be used as if it is an HTML tag as well. Okay, so that so when you build React applications, you are actually trying to build a lot of very small components that do one thing and one thing really well. So basically, my headline component will have the correct color, the color, correct font size, the correct font family, and all these things. So that, And then everywhere in my code, I just use headline. And I can be sure that all my headlines look exactly the same. Okay? And if somebody says, all right, uh, we have a new style guide for our company. All the headlines need to be green now. You just need to change something in this single file here. Right. Okay. So. Um, Just now you have the variable RC and you mentioned the ES two one five. Yeah. But you say that uh, the before code is using two one one five. Correct. And the after is using two zero one six. Yeah. Um, 
No, the before code is using whatever was before ES 2015. I don't know how it's called. JavaScript, old JavaScript. <laughs> I don't know. Why don't you use the old? Actually, I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to use, um, I would probably not be able to use it for executing Webpack. I'm not sure. Mike, do you know? Yeah. Basically, whenever I look into tutorials and other boilerplate repositories, they are all using the old syntax for the Webpack config. So I just copy and pasted that, to be honest. So uh, maybe yeah, you can try. You can try to replace this with uh, the new syntax, but I guess it would not work. In the, in the Webpack.js file, um, you want to use it? Because you mentioned that most of the tutorials never tell you about the Babel RC, and we also don't know whether the tutorial will work using this one that we are doing now. Yeah. Uh, so. You mean for now we just tell the the system to use ES to one on file exactly. Side. So how how it looks like on the file system is in your Django folder we will now have this Babel RC file, and whenever you execute um, your Webpack, uh, it will try to look if this file exists, and it will use it. I mean it's probably only half the truth. Actually, Webpack is using some call, is using something called Babel. And Babel is the one that is looking for the Babel RC file. Yeah. I think that's the point. When we execute web app, Webpack, we are not using Babel yet. But Webpack is the software that invokes Babel. So while we are executing Webpack, this file is not being used. And that's why I think the new syntax will not use when you execute Webpack. But I might, I might be wrong. Let's not discuss this in, in great length, because I don't want to tell uh, wrong things and end up on YouTube like that. <laughs> so. <coughs> So basically, uh, you know, we, we, we created the base config file and we created the local config file, right, which uses most of the parts of the base config. And we created a React.js folder, which has our entry point, which is this first component here, right? And we created a containers folder. Uh, I will explain, maybe I will explain later why I split this up into two different components, which has another React component and we have our components folder, which has the mini small headline component. Okay, so you can see actually React.js is not that scary. The mini smallest component uh, is just five lines of code, and it's relatively easy to understand what it does. Okay, and when you and that's what they say on the Facebook website. Give it five minutes. They're like, if you try to mess around with this, you will fall in love with it. And then you will dig deeper and learn all the difficult parts. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell you that it's actually very difficult to understand. They just tell, tell you, look, it's so easy. It's just five lines of code. Give it five minutes. And then you walk down the rabbit hole, and you don't find the way back anymore. OK. <laughs> and you end up becoming a JavaScript developer when you are actually a Python developer. Right? So this was uh, step three. And hopefully, when we run this, uh, what? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hmm? right. It still looks the same, right? Because so far, we have only created a lot of boilerplate code, config files, components, all this stuff. And we have even created a bundle, like this last command here in my tutorial will teach you how to actually create the bundle. But in our browser, we can still see the old view one. Right? Uh, that's because in our Django template, we haven't made any changes. We should now include the new JavaScript bundle that we have created in our Django template. And that's the thing where most people that use Django um, didn't really know so far how to do it nicely. So let's see how that works. Um, so if you go back to your view1.html, you remember that there was only one uh, tag here basically saying to render view1. Right? This is this view1 here. Now we put something different here. Now we, we put an empty diff container here, which an ID called app1. All right? And we, this is something specific to Django. Because we are using the web, Django Webpack Loader third-party app, which we have installed using pip before, we are now able to um, load a so-called Django template tag. And the template tag is called render bundle. 
And we can use this template tag to load specific JavaScript bundles with certain names. And when you remember back to, your, uh, to our Webpack config, on the, we had two entry points. The first entry point was called app1, and the second entry point was called vendors. Okay? So those are exactly the same two names that we will use here in the Django template. Right? And what Webpack, Django Webpack Loader actually just does is it teaches Django which name here corresponds to which bundle file on the file system that we hopefully have generated. If we didn't generate it, then it will crash and say that the file cannot be found. Okay? Um, so basically, um, when the server returns this template, it's going to be an empty website, just a white empty page, which has to load this JavaScript stuff here first. <coughs> and once this stuff is loaded, then it will replace this emptiness in between the diff here with our actual JavaScript uh, React components. And then we will see whatever the components output. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, there's a final thing that you need to in put into your Django settings so that Webpack Loader knows in which folder the bundle files will end up and where it can find these uh, Webpack stats JSON files. So I haven't really explained what these do. Um, the thing is, Every time you run Webpack, because we are using the bundle tracker plugin in our local Webpack config, it generates this file here. And the file basically only says that the app with the name app1 has its bundle file called like this. And this is the random string I was talking about. This one changes every time you, you save the file. right? And it also tells Django where this bundle can be found on the hard drive. Okay. So Django basically only loads this file. And because of that file, Django knows when I say render bundle app1, it knows which JavaScript file to import. OK? Um, yeah, so if we do all this, <coughs> and so this is step four, right? Yeah, this is step four. And we run manage py run server. And we go to the browser. Now we see something new, which is uh, the same. Let's have a look at our JavaScript components. Hey, why is the internet so slow? Here. See, I was using the headline component with the text something new inside. So we can, we can confirm we are no longer seeing some old Django template HTML stuff. We are now seeing the output, the result of our React.js application. OK? Um, all right. So, but so far, this is still very inconvenient, because every time you save, you also need to run Webpack to generate a new bundle, and then you need to refresh your browser to see the result. That's too much clicking around and typing in the terminal, so we need a way to make this automatic. Um, <coughs> first of all, we need a new file called server.js. This is another scary thing that, uh, where many people give up. And we need to copy and paste this whole code inside. I won't even talk about what this does. It's basically, uh, it's a web server programmed in JavaScript. And uh, we will use Node.js to, to execute this web server. This server will listen on port 3000 and um, do magical things. Um, we will see that later. Um, and in order for this to work, we need to make a little update to our Webpack local config. And uh, so this was our entry file here. We need to add these two lines. Okay. And we need to add this line, which didn't exist before. And we need to add these two new plugins. Before, we only had the bundle tracker plugin. But when we want to do Webpack, uh, when we want to do hot reloading with Webpack, we need to add these two plugins as well. So I mean, I don't even understand what all this means. I just copy and paste this from some tutorial, try it, it works, oh, it's great, never touch it again. And, and don't worry about it, right? So if you have all this in place, and this is uh, step five, uh, you can do manage by run server, 
You can go to your website and, oh my god, I see nothing. This is because I forgot that I also need to run node server.js. So when you want to develop your site now, you have to remember always to execute both servers, the Django web server and the node web server. Okay? When you do that, now our app is rendered again. Okay? And now look at this. This is the cool thing. When we save our code, let's say we change this to um, oh my god, it works. And save. Oh my god, it works. See? It saves, it changes immediately. Yeah, but it's only when you change the GS. Correct. When I save, I press save now, and there's a the change. Okay? So this is the hot reloading that's going on. <clears throat> and it's basically recreating the bundle and keeping it in memory. So Django is no, no longer looking onto the hard drive for the bundle. It's now looking to this port 3000 web server. So it's trying to fetch it from, uh, I don't know where it comes from, from memory, I guess. Um, and this is really powerful. This enables you, like if you have, for example, in your office, you have a two monitor setup. You have the website here, you have your editor here, and you code and code and code, and like creating beautiful user interfaces is really, really good with this because you can try like make it one pixel bigger, one pixel smaller, a little bit more to the left, to the right, and it's like so fast, it really encourages you to experiment and come up with new ideas and try different versions, okay? Um, so this is a great way to build websites. Um, so, yeah, many people um, already got that, that far, and then the next question is, okay, but how do I uh, deploy my stuff to my Django, to my already existing Django infrastructure, or to my servers, okay? Um, <clears throat> and as I already explained in the beginning, what the only thing that we need to do is um, we will create two more Webpack configs. One is called stage.config.js, and the other one is called prod.config.js. And those configs, same as the local one, they import the base config, and they change a few of the, of the variables here. For example, they say that um, we will have a specific folder for our bundles, which is called bundles slash stage. And we will also have a specific folder for production bundles. And for example, um, this plugin here, the define plugin, basically allows you to set something called like, something like environment variables that you can use in your JavaScript code. So this enables you to have things like, if environment is production, then use this API URL. Otherwise, use that. Or if environment equals uh, local, then do some special um, debugging output that you don't really want to use if for, for, the, for the real production website, all these kind of things. Or for example, I like to uh, descri describe my API base URLs in here. So they, if, I, if I run Webpack, with this config, <coughs> all my API calls will go against this URL. If I run it with this production config, all my API calls will go against a different URL. Okay? So that means every time when we want to release a new version, so this is, this is how you call Webpack. This is the command. And then you basically say, I want to run Webpack with this config. Okay? And so that means when I made some changes to my app and I'm ready to test it, I have to create two new sets of bundles, one for the staging server and one for the production server, assuming that it's fine. And I, after I tested it on staging, I want to have the same stuff on production as well. So that is a lot of stuff to type in the terminal, right? I have to, every time I have to create these two outputs here. So that's why I use something called Fabric. It's a very powerful and helpful um, package in Python. So we would use pip install fabric, and we will create a so-called fab file in our root directory. And we will put this little bit of code into the fab file, which basically only says that we have a fabric task, task which is called webpack. And whenever we run fab webpack on the terminal, it should execute these four terminal commands. OK, so um, maybe you have already heard about make files. Maybe when you uh, compile 
source code on, on, on Linux or whatever, you often have to deal with make files. So this is a similar thing like make files. Um, so uh, let me show this to you when step six. Okay. When you do fab webpack, it does all these things. It's just one command, but it's executing four different commands. It's, it deletes the already existing bundles from your last time, and it generates two new bundles for staging and for production, and puts them in the same folder again. Okay? So when I run git status now, I can see that a lot of files have changed. Right? Some files have been deleted, and there are new files that haven't existed before because they all have different file names, right? That's why I want to delete them, because if I only save new ones, I will, I will end up having 100,000 bundle files uh, half a year from now. And yeah, no need to, uh, version, uh, to put them into version control, all of them. Um, so yeah, for those, this might be maybe interesting for people who watch it on YouTube uh, who know Django already. Um, <coughs> My, my development workflow is like this. I go into my project uh, folder. I run manage by run server and note server JS so that I can see my stuff in the browser. I start coding my app. When I'm done, I commit my changes. And then I run fab webpack to generate the bundles. And usually I like to have a different commit only for the bundles. And then finally, I run my deployment script for my Django website. And that's the cool thing. That means you, you are now using React.js, but you don't really have to make any changes to your infrastructure. The, the, the way how you deploy Django stays exactly the same. However, I mean, every company does it in a slightly different way. So it doesn't interfere with that at all, right? So you only make sure that you generate your bundles, commit them into your repository, and run a normal deployment. Um, OK. I have three more steps. Um, which is probably a bit difficult for you guys now, but might be interesting for the video. Um, so I try to keep this a bit faster. I won't, I don't know, should I explain everything in detail? The more I explain, the less time we will have to try it on the laptops later. <laughs> so I have to find a good middle way. Anyway, so, yeah, quickly. OK, so the thing with, with React components is they have something called props and state. Basically, uh, when you think about the component, uh, for example, this, um, this headline component that we had, right? it's supposed to render something that has been passed into the component. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so the component basically doesn't really know what kind of text it should render. You can put any kind of text inside, and the component will render that text. So that is some information that has been given into the component from the outside. Okay, and um, um, this works for for small components that only deal with themselves. But what if you have, for example, a button component, and when you click at that button some kind of counter on your website should increase. And the counter is a different component. So these two components, they don't know about each other necessarily. They don't necessarily know about each other. So how does the counter know that it should increase when somebody clicks at the button? Right? So we need some kind of event system. Like the button, when you click it, needs to emit some kind of event, like I have been clicked. And the counter needs some kind of event listening system. So the, when the counter will listen to I have been clicked. And when he hears, when the counter hears that event, he will increase in itself, for example. Okay? Um, so if you read about React, you will uh, quickly learn about something called Flux. That's like a way of thinking how you can manage your state in React applications. Um, and there are a lot, dif lot of different Flux implementations. Um, so it's basically another JavaScript library that you need to import in your project. And then you need to understand the documentation of that library, and then you can use it. The question is, which one of those that exist should you use? There are like 10 different ones. Maybe, at, at the, I mean, three months ago it was 10 different. Now it's probably 20 different. And, but thankfully, some smart person came along and invented something called Redux. And um, it's a little bit like Flux 
but I think it's easier to understand than Flux and less complicated. What you need to do um, in order to use Redux is first you need to create a so-called action creator. Okay, you will put that into a file, for example, called counteractions.jsx. Uh, .js. Oh, that's a typo here. I need to fix that. <coughs> and basically, what we do is we create a constant which describes the name of the action. So let's let's assume there's a button. When you click that button, then the action increase should be emitted. Okay. And um, so Redux, this will make more sense later when we look at the next file. By definition, all the, the actions should have this uh, look. There, there should be uh, JavaScript objects, or if you think about Python, there should be dictionaries. And they should have a key called type. And the type should be some, some uh, string, actually. And you know this constant here is a string. Okay. Uh, so this is a bit confusing. So let's, maybe let's look at the next file. Um, so what you should keep in mind is the action creators describe what kind of actions can happen. Okay. Then we need something else that's called a reducer. Um, and we will put that into a folder called reducers and we call it counters.js for example. The reducers always look like this. They import the action creators that belong to this reducer and they describe how the data looks like. Usually when you are working with a more complex database, for example, um, I don't know, mm, you have a user profile, then maybe you would have user profile here, right? Or let's, let's, when you think about Facebook, maybe they have user profile here, and then they have posts for your timeline. And this is another key in this dictionary here. So basically, here you describe how the data looks like that this reducer takes care of. And we just want to increase the clicks in a counter so that's why I'm only having one variable here called clicks, and I initiate it with zero. Okay, um, and this is the actual reducer function here. It's basically just a function, any name, name doesn't matter, and into the function we put some state, the and at the very beginning we put in the initial state, and um, every time when an action happens, so when this increase action here is fired it will be put here as the action variable into the, into, re, into the reducer function. And with it, the last state will, put, will be put into the function. So you, you can think about it. Let's say, let's say we click at the button t 20 times in a row. That generates 20 actions that will be put into a queue. right? And then, slowly, each item will, ta will be taken out of the queue and will be put into the reducer function. So that's the state. It's the last state. right? together with one of those 20 actions. And then inside of this reducer function, we will manipulate the state. So we are, this is a weird new JavaScript syntax here. So this does not mean this is a dictionary. Don't get confused of the, because of the um, curly brackets. This means that we are taking the old state variable and we are returning a copy of it and we are only changing the clicks attribute to something new and we are increasing it by one. Just try to, like, this is basically what this statement means. It does, it does a lot of stuff in one line of code, which would usually take more lines of code. That's the only reason why we use this. So it looks nicer. Um, so you can think of the reducer like old state gets, we, we put the old state into the function, and we return a new manipulated state, a copy. We cannot manipulate the actual old state. We have to return a copy, OK? Um, and then, <laughs> and in order to get Redux working, you need to remember our app, app one.jsx file. It used to be a very small component, right? Now there's all this stuff here in the file. Before, the component was only using the other subcomponent. And now we have to import all this, which is uh, Redux related, and then we have to add this code. This is all for. Um, because your app will usually have more than just one reducer, it, it assembles all the reducers that are available and um, generates like one big store. You can think, so the store has several reducers. Re so remember, we only have one reducer, and the reducer is called counters, and it only counts the clicks, 
But if you have a really complex application, you might have a lot of different reducers, like maybe one reducer that only deals with user profile data, one reducer that only deals with your products if it's a web shop, one reducer that only deals with I don't know, uh, comments if it's a blog or whatever, right? And your app might be complex. It might have a web shop and a blog and a user profile and, and so on and so on. So that's why you want to have your data uh, capsulated in, in small reduce, hopefully, as small as possible reducer files. That's why you split it up into several files. Right? And this code basically makes sure to collect all these files and generate one big store out of it. And then it wraps this around our outermost component. And then this component is, becomes more powerful. It's now listening to all the actions that are happening. And if some actions happen um, that change the data, the component will re-render itself automatically. That's kind of the idea. So um, when we go into the, uh, so this is app one is our outermost component, right? And we were loading another component here. This one needs to change a little bit. We need to import connect and put it on top of the class as a decorator. So this add symbol here means it's a decorator. And <clears throat> we basically just say that inside of our class, we want to, be, we want to have a variable called counters. So we, I made up this name here, counters. I could name this in any way. And counters is the counters reducer from our store, right? Because we, I said that we, we, we are assembling all the reducers, and they will be in the state variable here. So we could have state.userprofile, state.product, state.whatever. In our case, we only have one state.counters. And obviously, I just keep the same name and then inside of my React application, I can now make use of this counters variable. Okay, it's now part of the React.js properties. Uh, this will confuse you because you you need to read the React.js tutorial to understand what properties and um, uh, um, state means. But basically, just think about it like this is a a bucket of variables that this React.js component has access to. And one of those variables is called counters because we connected it to our reducers. OK? Um, so yeah, let's just try if this thing works because it's always so much nicer when, when something happens on the screen. Step seven. OK. So I run manage py run server. So this is my button here, and when I click, it increases another component. Okay. So, so that one is just temporary in your browser. When you yeah. refresh it, it becomes zero. Yeah, but when I refresh it, it, get, it gets back to zero. Exactly. And that's a good point. The last step will deal with that. Like, usually you need to fetch your data from the database. So every time you load, you reload your app, it refetches the data and displays the last the data that was uh, safe in the database last. Here I'm just initiating with zero, and then we are counting up from zero. And next time, when you reload the application, we are initiating from zero again, right? Um, all right, cool. So that works. There's uh, so two more things. Um, <coughs> styles. So you all know a little bit about HTML. So that means you also know a little bit about CSS probably. Probably, right? Who knows about CSS? OK, so it's almost the same people that also know about HTML. <laughs> um, and this is something where the community is uh, in a heated debate, because React basically um, makes it very easy to define your styles right there in JavaScript. So you are no longer writing CSS files. No longer, you, you will no longer have central style sheets for your application. Instead, you can put your styles as a JavaScript object right next to the component that's being styled. And this is really powerful because, um, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm a very bad web designer, but every single project that I have ever done ended up having a 3,000 lines style sheet that nobody dares to touch. Like you are usually only adding more stuff to the style sheet because you are scared to delete anything, because you never know when your site has uh, like your website has 300 pages and subpages and whatever. You never know if I delete this, 
will suddenly something on my website look ugly? I better don't touch it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, um, there are people that are only writing CSS and they are very good at it and they know how to maintain their uh, CSS files properly. But usually, um, most of the teams I've worked with, they, they just accepted the fact that the CSS file is a huge, you know, a huge mess. Um, and you don't have this problem here anymore. If, if you wonder, hmm, can I change this color to red? Then you will just check where is it used. So this is the style called counter, and then it's being used here. So you look at this component here, and you know it's a relatively small component, and they are usually always pretty small, and it's a relatively small chunk of Java, uh, CSS code. So you can, the, a developer, even a developer who doesn't know the whole system, who has just joined your team and he has the task to fix this one component, the developer will probably be able to make a good decision if it's safe to change this to red or not, right? So that means you will, have, you will actually have only uh, CSS code in your app that really matters and no dead CSS code that nobody uses anymore, okay? Um, but the syntax are different. Than yeah, the syntax is different, so you cannot use uh, dashes in here. Usually it's font dash size text dash decoration and all these things, you have to use camel case, so-called camel case. So you start with a small uh, letter and then after, when there used to be a dash here, this letter has to be capital, okay? Um, so, and, in, and there's another uh, library called Radium. Actually, there are a lot, a lot of different libraries for the React.js ecosystem that help you writing styles right there in JavaScript. And I just happened to stumble upon Radium when I needed it, and I stick to it. So I don't know if it's the best one, but for me, it does everything that I need. And so you just need to import Radium, and then you need to put another decorator around your class here, and that's all. Then you can use style equals, and this is some weird uh, new JSX syntax from Facebook. So you are saying that the style attribute is going to be a variable, so that's why we put the curly brackets here, and the variable is supposed to be an array, that's why there are square brackets, and the first element of the array is the counter style, and then the counter style is here, all right? So we can even put comma separated more than just one style, and they will override each other. So that way you can write a little bit more modular code. Um, yeah. I'm not going to show this. It basically only makes the counter blue, so it's not a big difference. The last part is, so, I mean, this tutorial so far, if you do this at home, you can follow this. You will end up at the same stage, and then you are like, okay, cool. Now I know how to do Django. I know how to do React.js. I want to build uh, the next Facebook now. And, um, <coughs> <laughs> okay, so how do I get data, right? That's like the next important question that you will definitely ask yourself. And and that's actually a lot of work that you need to do for this. Um, first of all, so I, I'll rush through this a little bit. Um, I created a utilities.js file, which basically, okay, so no, I have to go one step back. Um, there is a new standards coming up on how browsers can do AJAX requests. So if you have used jQuery before, there's the jQuery.ajax function, which allows you to write JavaScript code that can like talk to other websites and, and other web servers and APIs. And there's something new coming up because you might not, you might not be using jQuery. If you use React.js, usually you will not use jQuery anymore. So how do you use, how do you do um, AJAX requests now, right? So there is a, a new function coming up here called fetch. Uh, sometime in the, in the future, browsers will just natively support this and Node.js on the server will also support this, but right now, nobody really supports it, so you need to import another mm, library called isomorphic fetch, which is a so-called polyfill for your browser and for Node.js to make sure that this fetch function here will work in your browser and on the server. So just accept that like, sooner, like, like maybe three years from now, this line will no, no longer be necessary, necessary hopefully. Um, and the fetch function is returning, uh, oh god, no, I need to go into promises. Uh, it returns a so-called promise. Mm. Okay, I'll not explain this. Basically, when you 
when you talk to a server, there are several things that can happen. First of all, the response will be successful, right? The server gets back to you with a response. Or the response will be some kind of error message. A very common error message is 400, which probably means that you send wrong data and the server is saying, I'm here, I, I can hear you, but the stuff that you sent to me doesn't make any sense. So the server will return with errors. There's another very common uh, error that can happen, the 500 internal server error. You might have seen that when you go to a website and it's just white and says internal server error. Um, so any kind of, a lot of, it's not just a 500 error, a lot of different errors can actually happen. Um, <clears throat> and finally, the fifth thing that, wait, how many is it? Uh, success, five, 400 error, 500 error. And finally, the fourth thing that can happen is that you don't have an internet connection. So your request will end up nowhere and time out probably. Um, so I basically just wrote a function. The function is called request. It, request. it requires the URL you want to talk to, some additional options. We are not using the options here in these examples. And then four callback functions. So this is a, this is a weird thing that actually you can do this with Python as well. You can write a function that accepts other functions as parameters. Okay, so we are basically putting in four different functions into this function, and then we are reacting to the different things. So if the fetch request returns, we check the status. If it's 200, it's a success. That means we, uh, we, we turn the JSON response into uh, some JavaScript objects, and then we call this callback function here, okay? And so if it's an error, we, we call the other callback function. If it's a really bad error, we call the 500 callback function. Or if it's a really, really bad error and then, then the internet didn't work, we call the failure function. So this will make more sense when we look at this here. Um, <coughs> so this should look familiar if you didn't fall asleep in the two steps ago. <laughs> um, it's another action creator. Right? We, had the, we had an action creator for counters, which had these uh, constants here, it, you know, the increase. Here we have the four kinds of results that can happen, and we need another one to signal that we have just started doing a fetch. Right? So these are the five things that always happens when you talk to the internet. You start talking to the internet, and then either it works, or in lots of cases it doesn't work. So that's why we create five different actions here. Okay, <coughs> and you mean, you mean that one is fetch repo is something that we have to fill in ourselves? That's is something that you have to make up yourself. So I'm, I'll, I didn't tell you that. So I'm trying to build, extend our app so that it fetches all my own GitHub repositories from GitHub. So that's why I call this uh, fetch repos repositories. Okay, so if you would write a function that's supposed to, to fetch the user profile, for example, then you would call it fetch user profile and fetch user profile success and so on. You can make up the name yourself, something that describes the thing that it's supposed to fetch. Okay? And you might remember from the counters action creator that it should return something like this that has a type and returns uh, the, the increase constant, right? There's a second way that we can do. Um, we can re return a function instead that needs to have the dispatch parameter. This is really difficult to explain. Um, even when I look at this, and I have used this like 100,000 times now, I still have, hard, have a hard time wrapping my head around this. Um, so basically, this basically tells Redux that we are trying to do an action here that um, takes a lot of time because we don't know when the result will come back to us, right? When you talk to the internet, you don't know how long it takes for the server to respond. So this is so it's a so-called asynchronous action that's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry's giving up, huh? <laughs> don't give up, Sherry. <laughs> almost there, it's the last step, and almost at the end of the slide. Um, all right, so... Um, yeah, so... I'm basically, first I'm dispatching the action that tells my system that I'm going to talk to the internet now, right? That's the first one. And then 
I call this request function, the one that I described above, that I have written here, which allows all these callback functions here. Right? So keep this in mind. Keep this function definition in mind. When we go down here, here we are using that function. Right? And these are the four callback functions that the function definition requires that we are passing into the function. The syntax might be a bit confusing, but uh, this is some new JavaScript syntax to create an anonymous function on the fly. So when you see these brackets here with the fat arrow, that means that this line is a function, although it doesn't have this kind of syntax where you really say this is a function called so and so. Right? This basically means this is a function without any name, and it requires one parameter, and it, it, this is the code inside the function. Okay, so basically you can see that we are having four functions here, and it's exactly these four functions that our request function requires. Okay. Um, all right, and then we would create a new reducer, which which has uh, the repositories from GitHub that I'm trying to fetch, and a variable that says, is it currently loading or not? Okay. And here you can see that we are now listening to the different actions that can happen. For example, when we start fetching, we change our state and we say now it is loading. We set it to true. All right? And if it's successful, we say now it's no longer loading and this is the result that we got. So we change repos to whatever is attached to the action. Okay? And in all other cases, we just say now it's no longer loading. But you know, we still have no repositories. So that's the re reducer. And then uh, you need to make a lot of changes here and there. <laughs> and here is how we can change the React component. Remember, all the React components, they have this class, and then they have the render function. And they are supposed to return some kind, something that looks like HTML. Okay? So this is exactly this render function from our React component. And now here we can connect to our reducer and we can say is it loading or is it empty like we don't have any repositories in that case we render a loading screen otherwise we render the real component okay and then um, th but you can dig through this if you do this at home I created another component which takes care of uh, showing all the different repositories that we fetch from the internet and this component looks like this um, it's basically using for each to iterate over each component and then render just a diff with the component name. Right? So, I mean, this is uh, too complex to describe now, and, and, and we need to get to, to finish to wrap up this talk. So, this is something if you look at this at home, you will, you will probably understand it after a while if you stare at it long enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but let's just see what it does. That's so, more, so much more interesting. So, Step. Last step. Manage pi run server. Saw that. It shows loading. And then when GitHub responds with my repositories, it's showing all my GitHub repositories. It's the, this is the same that you can see when you go to my GitHub profile here or here. Whoop. Repositories. Repositories. And see, these are my repositories here. And we are now fetching them because GitHub actually has an API. You can go to api.github.com. Um, I forgot the name. It's probably users. Oh, yeah. And then the username and then repos. And it will return this lot here, which is a so called JSON string. And here it is like Chen Tweep is one of my repositories. It has this ID, and this is the full name, blah, blah, blah. And there's a few, a few extra information about this repository. So see, Chen Tweep also shows up here in our React application. All right. Yeah, so. OK, so for the record, to wrap this recording up, um, 
if you follow these steps on this GitHub uh, repository here, I have actually basically everything that I just told you is also written down here. So you can go through this step by step. All the code you can just copy and paste. If you're not sure how your folder structure should look like, just open this in another tab and compare how your hard disk, the files on your hard disk, how they look like in comparison to what I've created in this step, right? And then at the end of the step, you should always be able to do manage pi run server, node server JS, open it up in your browser, and, and then you should see something, okay? So I really encourage anyone who wants to deal with Django and React.js to just go through this step by step and yeah, hopefully be, um, hopefully be inspired uh, that this shit actually works and is actually relatively easy to set up. You don't need to change your Django deployment process and you can step by step start uh, replacing old stuff on your website with uh, fancy React components. So maybe one example uh, that I just deployed two days ago. So this is our old Django website and we are selling whiskey here, for example, if you have a lot of cash. <laughs> So I basically replaced the whole filters and shopping grid here. So because I wanted this to be real time and everything. So now I can click at a filter and it reloads immediately and shows me the result immediately. Okay, this is not a good example. Let's go to art. Or for example, I can click at next page and it just loads the next page, right? Without actually doing a page reload. So the browser is not reloading the page. It's just sending an API request to our server, and the server is sending back something like the JSON string that we just saw from the GitHub API, right? So I can filter for prices, you see? And it, it always changes immediately. So it's pretty fast. The, pre, the re rendering of the React, com, React, React components is extremely fast. And this is so much different from jQuery. With jQuery, when you got back the AJAX response, you still need to find the DOM element that you need to remove or to replace or to update in some way. React doesn't care about this. All you care about is updating your reducers, right? So basically, you are, when you think about your application, you only think about uh, a data structure, right? You think about what do I need to display to the user, and it's, it's just a data structure in your reducers, and then you write those React components around, the, uh, and they have access to the reducers, and they, di they display the correct values. That's all you do. And you are no longer caring about DOM manipulation at all. You are only caring about updating your reducers. That's all you need to do. And the DOM needs, uh, knows how to up update itself. Huh? OK. Thanks for watching, I guess. Mm -hmm.